Um, basically, the blood is five to six liters, about 10% of your total body weight. Okay, uh, it's sticky, it's opaque, um, it also has metallic taste because there's a lot of salts in there, right? You know about this sodium, potassium, it's all in your bloodstream. So you bite your lip, blood is coming out, it tastes a little salty or metallic, so to say. Uh, the color varies um, from an oxygen rich uh, color of red, so scarlet to a dark red. Never blue. All right, despite what you see with your veins, it's because of the way the light comes in, the refraction of light uh, bends into your skin, it appears blue. I mean, to prove that your blood is not blue, I mean, you would know, know this, um, but even if it you know, goes to the air, think about what happens. If you, whenever you get your blood drawn, it's not even touching the air and it goes right into a tube. And the tube, you know, when the blood goes inside the tube, it's red, okay? So it's never blue, it's just uh, an optical illusion the way that the sunlight goes into your, your skin, so if you see veins on your skin. Blood pH is between 7.35 to 7.45, and that's a critical thing. Uh, when we get into um, acid-base balance, we'll go more into that, okay? And the temperature is slightly higher than the rest of your body, all right? Not much, maybe like a half degree, okay? Um, blood is the only body's fluid tissue, all right? Actually, lymph is also, but we'll talk about that later, but the main one is, is blood. And it's composed of plasma and formed elements. And I explained to you uh, about that earlier, where you get blood drawn, goes into a tube, you have whole blood, and then it spins and spins and spins in a centrifuge, and all the heavy stuff goes down to the bottom, and all the light stuff goes to the top, and we split all that. The light stuff is going to be your plasma, which is made mainly water. The rest of it is going to be what we call formed elements, which are all your uh, blood cells. Okay. Um, now keep in mind, the only cells that are in your body that are not attached to anything are blood cells and meta uh, metastatic cancer cells. In other words, cancer, you have a tumor, and then if the cancer cells break off of that, they'll go into your bloodstream. Well, they're not attached to anything either. That's what we say is the cancer's metastasizing or spreading to another area, okay? But um, for normal cells, the only ones that are not attached to anything are your blood cells. And I'm talking about your formed elements, so your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and platelets, which are these over here, okay? So erythrocytes, erythro meaning red, sites. Leuco meaning white, sites. Thrombo meaning clotting, sites. We can refer to them also as red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and it is universally accepted to even use these abbreviations. Everybody in the world knows what you're talking about. Okay? And keep in mind, when you have the percentage of red blood cells when you compare it to the whole blood, we give it a name, something called hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in your whole blood. And on an average person, it's about 45%. Males, a little bit higher, maybe about 47, 48%, but not much difference. It's because we have more muscle mass and more blood needs to go there. Okay? This is what they look like, as you've seen before. Red blood cells, we have many of those. The, red, uh, the white blood cells, we talked about the five different types. There's two of them up there. And the platelets which are really fragments off of a gigantic cell. But of those three formed elements, only one is a true cell. Red blood cells are not true cells because they're missing a nucleus. Okay? Uh, platelets are not a true cell because they're really a fragment off of a gigantic cell. You take a plate, smash it on the table, take a piece of it, that's a platelet. Okay? The only ones that are true cells in the meaning that it has all those organelles inside we are what we call the uh, white blood cells. Those are the ones that can go through mitosis because they do have nuclei, okay? So the functions of blood um, transport oxygen, nutrients, waste products, and all those wonderful hormones you're really getting into your brain, okay? Uh, it'll do for protection, it'll stop bleeding, fights infection. Um, also, uh, with a fighting infection, we'll learn about the different um, cells, the immune uh, cells, and also antibodies. Um, and also, uh, it's going to be able to keep the homeostasis going, keep the pH the way it's supposed to be, 
keep the total volume and electrolyte balance the way it's supposed to be. Okay? And we get into this ETOH deals with ethanol or alcohol, and we'll get into that later on. Okay? So again, I'm just saying you get blood taken over here into a tube, it spins around in a centrifuge, and then it splits up. All the heavy stuff goes to the bottom, which are going to be your red blood cells. Then there's going to be a thin layer over here that appears in a, a, a white or a white buffy area. We call it a buffy coat. Um, that's where your leukocytes and your platelets are. It only makes up about, well, less than 1% of your whole blood. And the light stuff up here is mostly water. That's your plasma. But it also contains a lot of other items, uh, namely um, all those hormones, fibrinogen, all proteins. Uh, oxygen gases, a lot of things are, are in there also. Okay? Um, so it's the same thing, just shown uh, a little bit more specifically. Okay? And we named the, all the white blood cells, so that's where those are over here. Alright, and these are things that are in the plasma besides uh, water. It's about 91% water, the plasma, but the other 9% are these things here. Whether there's proteins there, non-protein things, like lactic acid, creatinine, organic stuff, anything with a carbon in it. So we have carbohydrates, amino acids, glucose, anything with a charge, sodium, potassium, calcium, and so forth. Um, and then, like I said, we also have uh, respiratory gases. So this stuff makes up about 9% of the plasma. And if you want to go into more details about uh, what's in the uh, plasma, it's all over here, and it kind of tells you the functions of those. Okay? But we're going to learn about all those throughout the rest of AMP2. So basic functions about red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelets. Red blood cell carries oxygen. That's its main thing. White blood cells will fight infection. And platelets, well, they're going to stop the bleeding. So when you put this together, and this is what they look like. Again, this is red blood cells. There's not a hole in it. They kind of get sunk in. We call it biconcave. It's uh, concave on the top and concave on the bottom. Uh, these are your five different white blood cells. We did them all before. And your platelets here. So if we know what the functions of these formed elements are, then we know what we can do in terms of disease. Okay? And if you saw my video, I kind of explained a little bit about that. So I'm not going to go too much into that. Okay? Now, hematopoiesis. Big fancy word for hemato meaning blood, poesis meaning synthesized of. So this is how do, how do you make a red blood cell? How do you make a white blood cell? How do you make a platelet? This is what this is, hematopoiesis. Okay? So it's a production of these formed elements. Now, everything comes from one stem cell. That stem cell, that magic stem cell, is something called a hemocytoblast. The major stem cell that is going to make all the red blood cells, all the white blood cells, all the platelets. Okay? That one stem cell is going to do that. And the stem cells will develop into different things. So let me just show you the next picture to make, make it look a little bit easier to comprehend. There's our hemocytoblast. That is going to make, and if you skip this for a moment, this will make your red blood cells, all the, diff the five different white blood cells, and your platelets. There are different steps in here. Okay? You don't need to worry about all of them, so let me tell you which ones you need to worry about. Okay? Um, well, actually, when we get into, well, here, okay. So here, here's the red blood, or, I'm sorry, this is the stem cell over here, the hemocytoblast, and this is the line that it's going to take to become a red blood cell. You do need to know that it becomes a uh, erythroblast. Blast is kind of like an early erythrocyte. Okay? And the other one that you should know about is that it becomes something called a reticulocyte. That's a number you're going to be seeing later on when you get into your medical profession. Reticulocyte. This is the first time the red blood cell does not have a nucleus. It gets extruded out. You see it, or extruded out like that. Before, by the time it gets to the reticulocyte, it had a nucleus. But once it becomes a reticulocyte, it doesn't have the nucleus anymore. Once you lose the nucleus, it can't go through mitosis, so therefore, the red blood cell has a lifespan, and in this case, the lifespan is 120 days. White blood cell count, or the white blood cell, you should know that the hemocytoblast becomes a myeloblast, 
and then from a myeloblast, it's going to make the granule site, namely basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. The stem cell can become a lymphoblast, and then that will become a lymphocyte. The, hematis, or the hemocyto, or, yeah, hemocytoblast can become a monoblast, and that will become a monocyte. All right. The last one over here, the hemocytoblast can become a megakaryoblast, and then that's going to be called, that will turn into a megakaryocyte, and then from there, pieces come off of it. These pieces are known as platelets. Okay? So you really don't need to worry about these intermediate things in the center here. Okay? So hemocytoblast, that major one, you should know that one. You should know that that will make an erythroblast and then a reticulocyte and then the red blood cell. It could be a monoblast, a lymphoblast, a monoblast, and they will turn into these five different white blood cells. And then the last one here, megakaryoblast becomes a megakaryocyte, and then fragments come off and become platelets. Okay? Not too bad. You look at that, it looks busy, but you can do it in probably two minutes. You know the stuff in one minute. Okay? Not too bad. Now, where's the source of blood synthesis? Well, the plasma proteins all come from the, uh, the liver. Okay? But then, what about all the other things? Well, it depends on the age of the person or fetus. Okay? In the fetus, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. In the fetus, they're made by the liver and spleen. Even before that, for the first couple of weeks, it's made in the yolk sac. I won't ask you about that. But the liver and spleen wasn't there yet. So in the embryo and fetus, it's the spleen and the liver that make up these formed elements. But then the baby is born. And what happens is, it's now in children, the bone marrow, the inside of the long bones, specifically the leg bones, they will make the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Now in the adults, a little bit complicated, but not too bad if you understand the concept. In adults, it is in the bone marrow, but the primary source is in the trunk area, meaning it's going to be the trunk and head. So the skull bones and also the vertebrae and the ribs. Okay, also the pelvis too. That's where our, all of us are adults now, that's where our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are coming from. And the skull, the vertebral column, the ribs, the pelvis. But, what if for some reason we are not making enough red blood cells. For instance, or white blood cells for that matter. For instance, what if we are losing a lot of blood for whatever reason? Maybe cancer's doing that. Menstrual cycle, really losing a lot of blood. Okay? A lot. That you can't even function. Well, now your brain does this. The factories that are making, that normally would be making the red blood cells and all, say, which are in the head and the, and the trunk, say, look, we need to make more red blood cells and white blood cells. So it sends a message, sends a message to the brain. Hey, brain, we used to make uh, red blood cells in the legs when we were children. Those factories are still there. Yes, there's some cobwebs there and all, but the factories are still there. We need to make more red blood cells. Is it possible that we can get that, those leg bones activated again. And the brain says that's a wonderful idea. You have these conversations in your body. All right? So what happens is, is that the second source, it's going to go to the leg bone. Because that's what it was before. Does that make sense? Okay? And if they need it even further, then your liver and spleen will kick in. Because that was even before that. So it's not uncommon if someone has, let's say, cancer, leukemia, or something like that, and they need to make more white blood cells, that all of a sudden they're going to get leg pain. Like a 40-year-old start getting leg pain. 
Why? Because the leg bones are becoming more active and making more white blood cells and red blood cells and all. Okay? Now, I don't want you to think that, oh my God, I got leg pain, I got cancer. No, there's, oh, you've got to put everything together. What I'm saying is somebody who does have cancer, it would make sense why they may have leg pain. Because their legs are being more activated. Okay? Because they can need to make more red blood cells. So, <clears throat> this is just showing you in red the area where uh, primary sites are for hematopoiesis in adults. Okay? Questions on that? So there's your formed elements. We talked about granulocytes and agranulocytes, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Okay.